What's the hardest thing you've ever accomplished? Do you remember all the pain and anxiety that went along with that? And then the wonderful feeling of victory after you accomplished it? Well, today I want to tell you about perhaps one of the most incredible accomplishments in history. Hi, my name is Gabe Bauer and this is Top Shelf History, where we combine great stories with great drinks. This is the Plantation Blazer. It is the cocktail I have made for you today based on the Haitian Revolution. It is made with orange juice, cognac, and Haitian rum, and it is as delicious as this story is incredible. Now, where to begin? The Haitian Revolution is one of the most complex wars I have ever studied in my entire life. And I could spend years going into each of the factions and their motivations and how they ended up at the end of the war, but we don't have time for that. So let's start with Hispaniola. Hispaniola is the island which today contains the countries of Haiti and the Dominican Republic and was among the first islands that was encountered by Christopher Columbus and his crew in 1492. And as was with the times, Spain colonized with Christopher Columbus the entirety of the island in search of raw earth materials in order to support their empire. They really liked ores though, and when they weren't finding enough in Haiti, they decided to shift their focus to Mexico and Peru. Enter the French. With the Spanish focused elsewhere, the French came in and colonized the island for themselves, planting their biggest cash crops, sugarcane, indigo, and coffee. And these were very successful. So successful, in fact, that they actually produced 33% of France's foreign trade. They were doing really, really well, but the majority of all of their cash was on plantations. And plantations required laborers, and the laborers weren't going to be paid. These plantations needed laborers, and these laborers would be imported from Africa. Now, the slaves were treated brutally, and I mean worse than perhaps your wildest imaginations, worse than in some cases than even in America. And I know that's weird to say, trust me, for me, it must be even weirder for you to hear. But let's give you some context. After the ban on the international slave trade, Americans looked at their slaves as investments, and they wanted to keep their investments around for as long as possible, since laborers now were finite products, and they kind of wanted them around so that they could make more laborers demented as it is. But in France, up until the point of their revolution, they didn't really have this problem. There was no ban on slave trade for them, and so they could just import new laborers when the old ones died off. It wasn't really that much of a big deal for those plantation owners. So the motivation was then to work your slaves pretty much to death. I know, it's awful. But these plantation owners could work their slaves to death because productivity was at their highest value. To give you an idea of just how big the scale of this was, between 1680 and 1776, 800,000 slaves would be imported to Haiti. One third of them would die within the first three years. Just awful, either from disease or from overworking. But as a result, it made Haiti one of the most well-known and rich colonies in all of France. Life in Haiti was rough, and it was about to get a lot more complicated when the French Revolution began. Now, there were five ethnic and economic groups that were operating in Haiti that were heavily invested in how the outcome of the French Revolution was going to impact the politics of the island at the time. There were the Grand Blancs, or the plantation owners, the big whites, who owned a lot and had great influence. Then there were the Petit Blancs, who were the artisans, and the lower class whites, who tried to maintain their standing, mostly through race, and they would push a lot of racist things down the line. Then there were the Afranchis, who were the mixed race people between white fathers and typically black mothers, and they could be treated really, really well depending on whatever family that they were born into or really poorly, but they themselves would also have a big impact. Then there were the free blacks who were free black people, French citizens that themselves were plantation owners or artisans and lived on the island. And then there are the slaves. 
But since we're trying to avoid spending years on this episode, we're just going to focus on two specific groups, the free blacks and the slaves. Haiti was driven a lot by class and commerce at the time, and when the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen were passed in the National Assembly in France, the free blacks on the island sought equality for themselves. But after some fierce resistance from the Petit Blancs that then influenced the Grand Blancs, the blacks realized that the only way that they were going to be able to obtain equality was going to be through armed resistance. It was a powder cake, and it blew. They took up arms. All the while the slaves were watching. They made up 80% of the island and watching the free blacks. They knew if they could fight for their equality, couldn't the slaves do it as well? The answer was hell yes. Many abandoned their plantations and fled to the mountains. The ones who stayed wished they had gone. And as the cruelties mounted, it ended up in full scale revolt in 1791. Now, let's scale things back here for a second. Remember when I said that there was a constant inflow of new slaves into the colony? Well, this is where they become very important. See, a lot of the slaves that were captured were former warriors and politicians that were captured either during war with other tribes in Africa or by slave traders along the African coast and then were shipped across. These weren't men that were broken. They weren't going to take their pain and their slavery without a fight. And this is where they made their mark. So when the opportunity for freedom and revenge came, they took it. They burned down the plantations, killed the slave drivers, killed the owners, and killed just about anybody else who was white. It was pure chaos. That is until one man burst onto the scene, Toussaint Louverture, a former slave himself who was freed at 33. He was organized. He was smart and he could lead the revolution to its pinnacle. That was until Napoleon invaded and took Toussaint as a prisoner. And Toussaint would end up dying in a prison in France. But while he was imprisoned, his subordinate, General Jean-Jacques Dessalines and others would continue the fight and eventually become successful, gaining independence in 1804. And at this point, we had seen for the first time in history, a slave revolt that ended in the taking of an entire nation. They did it guys, and they had a nation to prove it. Now, I am only just scratching the very surface of this story, but I could spend years going into everything. So we have a drink to get into. Let's get into the Plantation Blazer. Now with this drink, I wanted to make sure that we combined both French elements and Haitian elements because after all, that is what the war was all about. A battle of nations and a battle of ideologies. And I wanted them to come together in a single drink. So into our glass, we're going to put in one and a third ounce of cognac. Now I am using uh, Albert de Fusini collection cognac. This is the Selection Cognac, it's the cheapest cognac, so very affordable. This comes around 35 bucks at your store, but it's really, really good, provides a nice brightness uh, to your drink, and I think it's gonna be a great French element for us to start our drink with. So let me just pour in my one and a third ounces here. Now, if you're wondering why the weird measurements, it's just because I feel like the measurements that I have for this drink are appropriate to fill our glass and to make sure that we have the right flavor profiles uh, all the time. Next, we're going to follow that up with two ounces of Pango Haitian rum. Now this comes from Hrum Barbancor, which is a, uh, a rum company that is in Haiti. And this is a special flavored rum of theirs. It's not your just standard unflavored rum that you may find. They do do a aged rum for four years and eight years that are themselves really good. But I think to combine with the cognac, I would like something a little bit bolder. I think this goes really, really well. After all, our Haitian brothers out there, they were fighting a very bold war. A nice bold drink I think is good for them. So we're gonna put in two ounces of Haitian Pango rum. Fill that all the way up to the top and just pour that on in. This is gonna be huge for flavor. Uh, for a flavored rum as well, I will say that this isn't uh, so synthetic as you may find with others. So it, it's pretty refreshing in that regard and I really appreciate it because 
Uh, I've had some really, really bad flavored rums. Next, we're gonna throw in one and a third ounces of orange juice. So just like the French and the Haitians didn't get along, neither will these two flavors. So we need a bridge in order to make this one drink that is quite palatable. For that, we're gonna use orange juice. Now, orange juice is a great element because one, it's tropical, it could be found in Haiti, and it will taste delicious. So we're gonna throw in one and a third ounces of orange juice, pour that on in. Next, we're going to throw in our ice into our shaker and then top it off and get shaking. Oh yeah, now it's nice and chilled. Just have to get this off, there we go. And then we take out our Nick and Nora glass and we will strain it into our glass here. And look at that. It's beautiful, I love it. We still have a little bit of extra too, but I think finally we just need to garnish with the two main flavor elements of this drink, mango and pineapple. We even have a pineapple leaf on the end. And there you have it, the Plantation Blazer. It looks pretty awesome. Let's give it a taste. I lost my garnish. Ah, well, that is good. Oh man. I really love how the brightness of the cognac comes together with the pango rum. Uh, you get so much flavor from the mango pineapple, but it's not too sweet. It's actually cut back a little bit by the introduction of the cognac. It brings up the brightness and also the alcoholic taste in your mouth. Uh, the mouthfeel is great. The orange juice really binds these two together. Uh, it's a delicious drink. It looks pretty. Um, I like to think of this as the drink that is what you would celebrate with after winning your freedom. And hopefully the people of Haiti at the time, and perhaps even today, could enjoy a drink like this, knowing that their history is incredible and that their freedom was worth fighting for. And that sounds like Glass Call. So the start of the Haitian Revolution was a tumultuous time. And it's hard to say exactly what was the initial event that really kick-started everybody else into violence. I mean, there were so many different factions operating at the time, so many different groups, both economically and ethnically that were fighting for positioning on the island. But for the slaves, we can look at one particular event that is, I think, agreed upon throughout the historic community that was the start of the revolution for them. And that was a voodoo ceremony in 1791 that was known as Boy Kaman or Boys Kaman. I could be pronouncing it horribly wrong. It's B-O-I-S. C-A-I-M-A-N. But regardless, it was a voodoo ceremony conducted by a voodoo priest named um, Buchman. Now, Buchman was a, a Jamaican slave that actually was uh, exiled, I suppose, from the island. He w had a reputation about him for starting trouble and violence, and he was able to get away with his life up to this point and travel to Haiti. And during the Haitian Revolution, or at least the beginnings of the Haitian Revolution, he was able to get everybody together and make a supernatural prayer to the gods uh, in order for them to bless their new revolution, in order for them to throw off the yoke of their white powers that be, the white god that has subjected them to their slavery, and for the black gods, especially the gods that had connected them back to their African roots, to finally raise up and to raise them up to freedom, and this was an incantation to the supernatural on their part, and they celebrated this entire voodoo ceremony, and it is speculated that almost all of the leaders, the principal leaders of the Haitian Revolution, were actually at this ceremony and practiced voodoo themselves. Voodoo became a very big religion for Haitians at the time and has uh, continued all the way up until this day in some form or another. Uh, it's a pretty remarkable event considering uh, the supernatural appeal, uh, or I should say the appeal to the supernatural in order for them to be able to fight this fight for their freedom. Uh, it's pretty significant because there were so many different tribes that were 
enslaved and then brought to Haiti. And there was a lot of differences between those tribes, right? But this was, I think, one combining factor that brought everyone, despite all of their differences, under one specific goal, and that was freedom. And voodoo did a similar thing in that because it took all of the inspiration from the different tribal beliefs and combined it, mixed in a little bit of Catholicism in there at the same time. And now not only did they have a societal goal, but they also could find common ground religiously at the same time. And I think that is probably one of the biggest moments in the Haitian Revolution was this particular ceremony because it united everybody under one purpose for them to go forth and to get their independence. Thank you all so much for watching. If you guys would like to check out any of our other historically inspired cocktails, you can find them here, or you can also find them at TopShelfHistory.com. You can also find us at Rumble as well as on Locals. Locals is our community. If you would like to become a patron of ours, please join. It is awesome. We have some exclusive content for you guys there. But from all of us here at Top Shelf History, remember, history is better with a drink. Cheers. <laughs>